honored guests, faculty, staff, students, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us this afternoon for our webinar offering a new political strategy for the struggle to limit climate change. This event is part of the Center for International and Regional Studies Environmental Studies Initiative. Under this initiative, CIRS, the center has already carried out several research projects on the environment of the Middle East region, resulting in books on such topics as water insecurity and the geopolitics of natural resources. The event today serves as the launch of an expansion and deepening of this past work with a focus on understanding human-induced climate change in trans-regional contexts. We will be drawing on our faculty with core expertise around environmental topics to be the locus of a global network of national, regional, and international scholars working together to generate new knowledge and to translate knowledge into practice and advance understanding around how to support an ecologically su su sustainable future. In the coming months, CIRS will organize meetings and workshops on various topics under this thematic area. Tonight's speaker, Professor Anatole Levin, will be drawing from his book, Climate Change and the Nation State, The Realist Case, which was published by Penguin and Oxford University Press in 2020. His provocative take on how to move toward implementing measures which will mitigate climate change won him the 2020 Financial Times Book of the Year Award in the Environment category. Dr. Levin is a professor of government at Georgetown University in Qatar, where he teaches classes on international relations, foreign policy, and nationalism. He is affiliated to several academic institutions and think tanks, including King's College London, the New America Foundation in Washington, DC, and uh, the Valdai Discussion Club in Russia. He is the author of a number of books, uh, and I will only mention one, which is also another timely topic, America, Right and Wrong, and Anatomy, Anatomy of American Nationalism. And he has briefed US Congress and British Parliament numerous times in the areas of his expertise. So without further ado, I would now like to give the floor to Professor Levin to share his insights on what kind of political strategy is required to slow climate change after which we will open the floor to questions from the audience. Professor Levin, thank you for your willingness to launch our Environmental Studies Research Initiative with tonight's webinar. And to our audience, I just want to mention that uh, this, uh, this uh, event will be recorded uh, after the initial moderated discussion and conversation with, uh, with Professor Levin. We will open the floor, as I said, uh, for questions and answers from, from the audience. And I will talk about the logistics of that uh, later. Professor Levin, you have been rigor rigorously studying and researching the effects of climate change and international politics for the past several years. With these efforts culminating in your recently published book, uh, Climate Change and the Nation State, The Realist Case. Could you share with us, to start with, what initially prompted you to work on this particular topic? and also summarize for us the main findings that are presented in your book. Thank you very much, Dean Dalal. I'd like to say thank you to you and uh, also to the staff of uh, CIRS for inviting me to give this talk. It's a great honor uh, to give the opening talk of this new aspect of CIRS environmental program. And I believe that CIRS will play a very important role in spreading awareness of climate change and also in promoting thought about the response to it in this region. Uh, now, yes, I mean, my, my move to, to, to writing about climate change surprised a lot of people because I've written on many other things before, including you know, from when I was a journalist, from when I was working at a think tank in Washington and so on. Uh, the reason uh, is simply that, like so many, so many people around the world, I became convinced by the scientific evidence, uh, the evidence not just of uh, the existence of man-made climate change, but also of the extent of the danger that it poses to humanity uh, and to <clears throat> states around the world, including Qatar, the United States of America, and my own country, Britain. And 
the more I read about this, uh, the more I became convinced that the subjects that we usually write about in the area of security studies and international relations in terms of the major threats to states, um, that these are in fact secondary or sometimes even relatively unimportant compared to climate change. Because if you look at the, the, the great powers of the world, um, America and China, for example, where there is now all this talk of a new Cold War and that they pose these tremendous threats to each other, America and Russia, even India and Pakistan, short of nuclear war, there is no damage that these countries could do to each other, or, or in most cases, want to do to each other, which remotely compares to the damage that climate change will do to all of them in future, if present trajectories are not changed and if climate change is not limited. Uh, and um, of course, what I also became aware of, uh, once again, like everybody else who pays attention, uh, through studying this topic is that despite several international agreements to limit climate change, going back to the Kyoto Agreement in the 1990s, so far every target has been lost. Um, the vast majority of states have failed to meet the commitments that they made. Uh, and uh, in fact, um, carbon emissions have with certain dips as uh, last year because of the pandemic, uh, carbon emissions have in fact continued to increase greatly. And even some of the apparent reductions or real reductions uh, in carbon emissions from Western states, you know, which in some cases are quite uh, um, impressive, uh, but they are less than meets the eye because a large part of it is due to the shift of industry to East Asia and other parts of Asia, which of course is producing consumer goods uh, for Western markets, but is also producing more carbon gas uh, at the same time. Uh, and um, I, I've also become aware that the latest target set uh, by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, as the margin of safety, uh, which is uh, a growth in temperatures of 1.5 degrees centigrade, that target has almost certainly already been lost unless uh, we can find some presently not existent uh, technologies to suck carbon uh, CO2 out of the atmosphere. We are simply not going to meet that target. So real dangers are not in the future, they are already with us. And of course, you can already see that from what is happening in Australia, what is happening in California, and elsewhere around the world. Thank you. Uh, we know that there are complex and multiple factors that have restricted efforts by various states to combat climate change. What do you think are the main barriers towards adopting greater measures at the national level? Is it primarily political resistance, corporate resistance, or the economic and social consequences of adopting climate conscious policies? Corporate resistance does play an important role in some countries, especially the USA, but others as well. And of course, here we're not just talking about um, oil lobbies, but coal lobbies, of which the biggest is not in the USA, the biggest by far is in China, followed by India. Uh, then, especially I'm afraid in the United States, there is an element of political culture. Um, for supporters of the Republican Party, at least hardline supporters of the Republican Party, uh, they, they no longer argue, I'm afraid, on the basis of the evidence. It's not a question of uh, we don't believe on the basis of the evidence that man-made climate change is happening. It has become a question of we are not the sort of people who believe in climate change. You know, it's become a cultural marker. We are people who believe in God, believe in gun ownership, and don't believe in climate change. So that is also a, a factor. But I'm afraid that the, the, the biggest reason by far, which applies to every country, uh, is simply that um, 
reducing rapidly and then eventually eliminating our dependence on fossil fuels uh, is going to be very, very expensive. Um, it's not really a question of the technology. Um, in, in many areas, we already have the technology uh, or we are developing it quite rapidly as with electric cars. Uh, the point is that intro to introduce it is so very, very expensive. It's expensive for state budgets, it requires higher taxes, it requires a degree, should we say, of financial coercion through taxes, through carbon taxes and fuel taxes. Uh, it will mean higher energy prices, it will mean higher prices for consumer goods. And though there are real economic benefits to the change, and the, the, the book argues strongly in favor of what has been called a Green New Deal, in other words, a combination of action against climate change with technological advancement. Uh, unfortunately, despite some arguments, um, the, this does not, this isn't really the same as previous industrial revolutions where um, railways, the steam engine replaced the horse, the car replaced the, the carriage and so on. Uh, because actually our existing energy systems uh, are doing perfectly well at producing energy, uh, doing perfectly well at what they were designed for. In terms of profit, profitability, they don't need to be changed. The problem is, of course, that they're producing huge amounts of carbon gas and climate change at the same time. So um, this is the, the greatest ob obstacle. And to overcome this obstacle, uh, therefore, it's... I think this has been proved beyond doubt. You cannot simply leave it to the market um, and to profit incentives and to capitalism. That just will not manage it. There has to be a strong element of state leadership um, in this area uh, and state policy and state action. Uh, and for that, of course, you need to generate the necessary political will, you know, not just in governments, but obviously in their electorates and in shall we say, the ruling classes, the political classes around the world. So that's what my, my book is mainly about. It's how to generate the political will to take the necessary radical but also painful action within the limited time now available to us. Thank you, Anatoly. In your book, you refer to a number of MIT reports that provide a compelling review of the harsh deterioration of conditions and tragic consequences that we can anticipate in South Asia, Asia and in the, in the Gulf, if more strenuous and timely action on climate change is not undertaken. What would you say to citizens or leaders of these countries who might dismiss the findings of these reports or suggest that their conclusions are exaggerated and their predictions are too ominous, as many do, and you referred to that earlier? In your remarks? Well, I think that perhaps one problem with the arguments about climate change, and not all of them, but some of them, is that they've been too focused on, shall we say, the apocalyptic long term. And of course, in human and political terms, the long term is not 500 years from now, it's 100 years or less. Now, of course, if you start thinking in those terms, if we can't change existing trajectories, then you are looking at massive flooding uh, of coastal areas. Of course, Bangladesh in South Asia is the most endangered, but every coastal city um, from Mumbai, Karachi, round to Doha uh, will be seriously endangered by flooding. But in certain respects, that is a distraction, I think, from shorter term, dangers which we already see and which will, if climate change cannot be limited, will get radically worse easily within the lifetime of, well, Georgetown students um, you know, before, you know, while they are still middle-aged. And in this part of the world and in South Asia, uh, this applies above all to two things. The first is the rise in temperature and the second is water shortages. And the reason, of course, why this is so very menacing in this part of the world uh, is that um, many of these areas are already approaching or over 
the danger limit when it comes to temperatures in summer. Uh, and of course, in South Asia, not in the Gulf because of um, wealth and technology, but in South Asia, um, in many parts, there are already severe levels of water stress with very bad effects on, on agriculture. But as far as temperatures are concerned, the, the, the greatest risk here is, is something that's called wet bulb temperature, which is a combination of temperature and humidity, uh, something that we are well acquainted with here in Doha on occasions. And basically, I won't go into all the technical details, but what this is about is that, um, once again, as we know, uh, the human body can stand very, very high levels of heat, much higher levels of heat, if it's dry heat, because you sweat, the sweat evaporates, the body is cooled down. But if high levels of heat, of heat are combined with humidity, then even a combined temperature of 35 degrees is fatal within a few hours. Um, but well short of that, 31 degrees combination with, with humidity is already at the danger level when it comes to health. And what this means, of course, is that if temperatures rise, not on an even level across the, the year, but if you get really intensive heat waves carrying on for several weeks at a time, work in the open will grind to a halt. So construction in Qatar will grind to a halt. Uh, agriculture in parts of South Asia will become impossible unless people are going to risk their lives every time they go out. Uh, beyond that, there is the effect of the rise in, in temperatures on crops. Uh, at sustained levels, uh, temperatures above 40 degrees, that's to say, you know, if you have temperatures of above 40 degrees centigrade lasting for um, several months or even several weeks, uh, rice cultivation declines radically. For every rise of one degree in centigrade in temperatures, it's been calculated that the yield of wheat production goes down by about 10%. So you are looking at the possibility of a radical decline in South Asian agriculture. And that is one of the reasons why, um, and of course this will be coupled with increased water shortages, uh, and that's one of the reasons why the World Bank, for example, predicts that, once again, unless existing trajectories can be changed, by 2050, more than a third of the population of India will see its living standards begin to decline seriously. So <clears throat> this is not in some distant future. Once again, I mean, you know, many of my students, who I hope are watching this, to those of you who are watching it, thank you very much for turning up. But well within your lifetimes, um, you know, and when your children are still quite small, uh, you will see, if you come from South Asia or the surrounding region, um, really, really affects serious effects of climate change on your societies, unless you know, we can do something about it. Thank you, Anapur. Can you speak about the nexus between rising conflict and social disorder as a result of environmental degradation? Do you have any thoughts on the farmers' protests, for example, that have been occurring in India over the past months? Might we expect to see more of these sorts of social movements in agrarian communities as the impact of climate change is felt in other countries? I think that we certainly will, but <clears throat> This is an area where it is very difficult, and I would say dangerous in terms of argumentation, to be specific. Because, of course, if you look at any in instance of unrest or ethnic conflict, there are multiple causes. And you know, if you look at the farmers in India, um, I mean, the thing is that, you know, that, that there is a severe drought in North, North India now. And there are also changes in government policy, which ha have a major effect. Uh, but of course, there have been droughts in India before in the past. Uh, and it would not be right, you know, I think honest intellectually, to attribute this specifically to climate change. Similarly, you know, if, if you look at these growing ethnic conflicts in parts of Africa between pastoralists and agriculturalists, over water, 
these tensions have existed for many, many years. Um, they're getting worse at the moment because of water shortages. Uh, or if you look at the Syrian civil war, um, drought, it seems, um, helped to lay the basis for this by driving people from the countryside into the towns, exacerbating uh, ethno-religious tensions. But of course, those tensions had long existed, and there was also the factor of the oppression by the Ba'ath regime. Uh, but I think what one can say, oh, by the way, I mean, another factor in, in Syria was the fact, and, and this illustrates the way that the whole world is connected by the issue of climate change. Uh, one of the reasons for the steep rise in food prices before the Syrian civil war uh, is that there was a series of bad harvests in China, parts of China, and the Chinese bought up a large part of the world's uh, available grain stocks, thereby, of course, leading to a steep rise in in prices. But once again, one cannot specifically attribute this purely to climate change. But what I think what one can say is that the vast majority of calculations and predictions by experts suggest strongly that climate change will help make agricultural conditions worse as I said, will lead to a reduction in yields, will make water shortages worse, um, and that this inevitably will increase, uh, will play into a, a whole range of local tensions and conflicts. Not create them perhaps, but um, certainly make them worse. And this is above all true when it comes to migration. Uh, of course, people you know, who can no longer feed themselves in the countryside will move. Um, either to cities or to neighboring regions or to other countries. Um, India certainly already feels, well, the present government of India, but the previous Congress government as well, uh, are very worried about Bangladeshi migration and have um, erected a very ferocious barrier against it along the border with Bangladesh. So they're taking this seriously already. Thank you, Anatol. One of the central arguments of your book is that so far, appealing to states to harmonize their actions on climate change as part of their commitments to internationalism and humanity at large has failed to bring about sufficient and timely action. So alternate ideological tools are required to push climate action forward. Do you think that there might be a danger in appealing to nationalism and self-interest? even if the goal itself is to bring about global benefit through greater climate action. I, mean, I, I, I say very clearly in the book that I, I am in no way opposed to international agreements. I regard them as very valuable and necessary, um, nor am I opposed to international movements. Um, I've actually been consulted, amazingly enough, by parts of Extinction Rebellion. You know. uh, Greta Thunberg, I think, on the whole does a very good job, although I, I do criticize in my book some of the, the more naive and, you know, frankly impossible demands that they put forward, which on the whole I would say damage the, the case for action against climate change. But as far as nationalism is concerned, the mobilization of nationalism, uh, nationalism is here, you know, it's, it, it's all around us, frankly. Um, outside the European Union, and actually to a great extent, as we know, alas, from Brexit and other movements, even within the European Union, um, nationalism is a strong force in many parts of the world, and I would say actually in the great majority of successful states around the world, you know, it plays an absolutely key role in legitimizing governments and political systems. Uh, and in the United States, well, it's not just that, alas, we have seen <laughs> from the, the appearance of Trumpism, which, by the way, has very deep roots. I wrote about it in 2004, didn't imagine Trump, but I described the ideology that he represents. Uh, so there is this chauvinist um, American nationalism. But actually, you know, most of the Democratic leadership, um, Joe Biden, if you read his speeches, uh, Hillary Clinton, even Barack Obama, um, are American civic nationalists in their way, even if they don't call themselves that. They have a passionate belief 
in America you know, as, a as a representative and leader of democracy and freedom in the world. They believe that America embodies this. So um, you know, to, to, to say that I'm encouraging nationalism would, would I think, um, attribute too much importance to Professor Lieven. Uh, he wishes he were so important, but he isn't. Uh, what the book is trying to do is uh, to exploit nationalism, to turn nationalism in a positive direction by appealing to the, the, the commitment of ordinary people, and especially, by the way, of course, on the conservative side, to the future of their countries. You know, this in no way contradicts uh, concern for humanity in general, uh, nor is this in any way intended to encourage international hostility. On the contrary, a large part of the book, you know, as, as I've said already in answer to a previous question, consists of a very, very strong argument against geopolitical rivalry between America and China, America and Russia, India and Pakistan, Saudi Arabia and Iran, uh, on the grounds that, as I say, you know, a um, few generations from now, the historians of the future are going to be a bit like, you know, historians looking back at the European great powers before 1914, you know, who, who believed that Germany was the biggest threat to Russia, Russia was the biggest threat to Germany, Germany was the biggest threat to France and Britain, et cetera, et cetera. And it turned out, of course, that it was internal revolution that was the biggest threat to all of them and destroyed most of them in the end. I think that the historians of the future, unless we can get this under control, are going to say the same thing about us. They're going to say, how could they be so stupid when all the evidence was there? You know, that rivalry over these islands or reefs or sandbanks in the South China Sea was irrelevant because they're all going to be underwater in a hundred years' time. Whereas, you know, if we do not limit climate change, then there is a very good chance that over the next couple of centuries, both China and the United States will collapse as states and organized societies. Um, you know, that is the real threat to states. And the point, of course, about nationalism or patriotism, to give it a nicer word, but for me, that's that's a distinction without a meaning, actually. Um, is that it does have, at least intellectually and morally speaking, an interest in the long-term nature and survival of the country. Because it's been said again and again, the biggest problem about action against climate change is that painful, costly action have to be has to be taken by the present generation, but the worst effects Will only, affect, uh, will only affect future generations after, you know, certainly everybody in political power today is dead and even their children are dead. So how do you mobilize people? How do you motivate people to take action for the sake of their grandchildren and great grandchildren? Except in South Asia, where, as I've said, even, you know, present generation will suffer badly. And my argument is that part of the answer, only part of the answer, I, I certainly don't recommend this as any kind of panacea or universal solution, but part of the answer is to focus people on the long-term survival of their countries, of their nations, because in the end, that's what nationalism is all about. And I, I say in the book with reference to America, you know, on the great seal of the United States, you know, it, it doesn't say, you know, let, let's spend everything we have and live a wonderful life today and then let America go to hell. It says, novus ordo seclorum, a new order for the ages. In other words, we believe that America is going to be there, must be there, you know, as, as an example to the world for centuries to come. So that's you know, the core argument of the book about nationalism. Thank you. Uh, what do you see as the relationship between international movements of protest like Extinction Re Rebellion and state action? Or are the demands of such movements so extreme and unrealistic as actually to have a negative effect on progress towards limiting climate change? Well, I think that these, th these movements have a very positive effect in attracting attention. And, you know, without such movements over the years, um, frankly, I, I, far, far, 
far less would have been done. They just keep bringing it in, you know, into the attention of the media. And from that point of view, of course, you know, I used to be a journalist myself. As we all know, from the, head, the point of view of headlines, media coverage, the more dramatic, the better. You know, that's what gets the attention of the journalists. But you're right. I mean, there is a danger here. Um, and I think from two points of view, the, the, the first is, you know, if they couch their demands so high, not in the long term, uh, but in the short term, that, you know, everybody who stops to think knows that they just can't be achieved. Um, I give some examples of this in the book. <laughs> so saying that fossil fuel the fuels must be abolished altogether by 2030. That's just not going to happen. It can't happen. Um, and I quote the, you know, the French Greens as demanding that France completely abandon um, fossil fuels and completely abandon nuclear energy by 2030. Well, you know, that just gives ammunition to the people who say that these these people want us to freeze in the dark because that is what would happen. You know, the French electricity grid would collapse. <laughs> So that's one reason why, you know, I, I think that they're useful, but um, there are also problems. The second reason, though, is, is something that I became very aware of while I was reading, you know, studying for the book. Because again and again, while reading um, uh, you know, environmentalist authors, particularly, of course, on the left, but, you know, more generally within the, much of the environment, um, environmentalist camp, you would read um, arguments to the effect that uh, for serious action against climate change to happen, nation states must essentially disappear or at least be greatly, greatly weakened and their powers must pass to institutions of global governance. Well, that's just, it's not going to happen. It is simply not going to happen, you know. Um, this is very much, I fear, a, a, an aspect of Western intellectual narcissism, because after all, I mean, the, the biggest country, as far as climate change, uh, as greenhouse gas emissions is concerned, by a considerable margin, is now China. You know, try telling the Chinese government that, you know, the Chinese state has to disappear and be replaced by international government. But it's not just that. Try telling it to Narendra Modi you know, or Vladimir Putin, or actually Joe Biden as well, you know, try getting a bill through the US Senate saying, you know, America should give up its sovereignty to an international body. We know that's never going to happen. Um, and, you know, if, if, if seriously action against climate change has to wait for that, then there isn't going to be serious action against climate change. Um, and I also say in the book, you know, that states may well collapse as a result of unchecked climate change. But if so, the result will not be international government. It will be international chaos. And so you know, the core argument of the book is international movements of protest, great. International agreements, great. But the point of them is to push states into action, to embarrass them, to motivate them, to mobilize their populations. Uh, and um, I have to say, I think that tragically, of course, the, the experience of the pandemic has really reinforced this argument, because of course it would have been much, much better if we'd had really serious international coordination in advance. But in the end, so many of the things that had to be done, you know, closing borders, imposing lockdowns, um, uh, and now, you know, vaccination programs, mobilizing medical staff could only be done by states. And I fear also, you know, what, what we've seen, the, the difference between, you know, Britain and America um, and parts of democratic East Asia, by the way, you know, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, not, not just authoritarian China, but is that it needs to be not just states, but it needs to be strong states, you know, enjoying legitimacy, full legitimacy, governments enjoying legitimacy in their populations um, in order to carry out this kind of action. And I think that will be true of climate change as well. I think it is true of climate change. Thank you. Um, also on the subject of intersections between the local and the global, 
don't you think that control of local emission levels is not just a function of local consumption patterns, but these very patterns are often dictated by the demands of the global economy. And this suggests that solutions must address both local and global challenges. Yes, that, that's absolutely true. Um, and you know, I, I mentioned the fact that the, the, the appearance of um, uh, serious reductions in um, greenhouse gas emissions in the West is in part, only in part, but in quite considerable part, um, the result of the move of industries to East Asia, which are providing for Western markets. Now, that's becoming less so. You know, China is now producing very largely for Chinese domestic markets. But um, you see here, we're talking about not just the working of the international economy, but frankly, we're, you know, we're also talking about patterns of consumption. Uh, you know, the, 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 the biggest day of sales in the world is this singles day in China, promoted by Alibaba, you know, the, the Chinese online uh, company, to boost its sales, something like 40 the equivalent of $40 billion, I believe, of purchases in one day in China. Now, this is the, the working of the international economy, but it is also, of course, the working of the contemporary consumerist spirit. You know? um, nobody is ordering people to buy this stuff. You know? They've been, of course, encouraged, advertised into it, nudged into it by advertising, seduced, if you will, bribed. But still, in the end, it's their decision to go and you know, spend the money. So, you know, th this is why I believe that changing political motivation is so important. As far as um, global coordination is concerned, uh, I think that one factor that we are likely to see under the Biden administration and um, increasingly from the European Union as well, which does have unfortunately negative implications for this so-called new Cold War, is the use of tariffs as a weapon in this regard. It may well be that the only way that Biden could get radical action against climate change through the US Congress is if he links it to punitive tariffs against China, um, if China does not meet the same standards or even higher standards uh, than the US when it comes to climate change emissions from industry. So that's one way in which um, one could see the internationalization of climate change action. Uh, of course, um, that would place the American government in um, an awkward spot when it comes to some of its allies like India. But um, American governments have been in such awkward spots before and have somehow always managed to um, argue themselves out of it. So that um, I think that uh, there will be internationalization of action over this issue. Um, and of course, there will be further international agreements. Uh, but, you know, the conclusion of my book is that in the end, you know, nobody is going to raise taxes in Britain, let alone America or India or China, uh, because the United Nations has passed a resolution. They're going to do it because their government or, and their parliament or the countries without a parliament, just their government has done it. Uh, and if that's going to occur without mass protest um, and unrest, as we saw in the, you know, the yellow vest movement in France against higher fuel taxes and similar movements elsewhere in the world, if populations are going to accept that, it will be in part because of international feeling, international pressure. Um, but it will above all be because their government has convinced them that it is necessary in the end for their country. At least that's what I argue in the book. Thank you, Anatoly. Uh, in the forthcoming uh, paperback edition of your book, you take stock of the pandemic and the dramatic events of last year up to President Biden's victory. Given the challenging year we have experienced and the continuing focus of the world's attention on the pandemic, when do you think international attention can be reoriented 
towards climate commitments. And is it realistic to expect that states will take radical action quickly enough? Does the pandemic itself in some way provide a moment for the international community to reflect on humanity's vulnerability to natural threats? Well, I would say that there are two bad things from this point of view and two good things. The bad thing, obviously, is simply that the pandemic has distracted attention. Um, a good thing is that, you know, as you suggested, um, it has reminded us that, you know, despite our amazing technological achievements, despite our wonderful lifestyles in certain parts of the world and so on, you know, we are still, as individual human beings and as countries, deeply, deeply vulnerable to things that nature throws at us, you know, um, out of our control. I mean, of course, we have been able to take action against it, but, you know, the pandemic originated as so many pandemics have in the past, you know, the traditional thing, the interaction between humans and animals, you know, domestic animals or animals in, in Southeast Asia or Southern China. Um, so, you know, hopefully this, from an intellectual and moral point of view, this, this will focus attention on the fact that, frankly, we're not as great as we thought we were. And we're not as safe as we thought we were. And we have to take more precautions against what nature can throw at us. Or rather, not just nature, but nature as prodded and insulted and you know, by us. Um, now, from the economic point of view, there's also a good and a bad thing, or a bad and a good thing. The bad thing, obviously, is that we've all got a lot poorer, well, everybody except the Chinese, who seem to be doing wonderfully. Um, but certainly in many parts of the world, economies have suffered badly, and obviously states have less money to take action, and people who are poorer are going to be even less willing to make sacrifices. On the other hand, um, there is hope and several governments have talked about this, and so has the uh, President Biden and his team, um, about reconstruction after the pandemic. You know, the, the, the phrase that Biden has adopted, build back better. In other words, you know, don't just pump money into the economy, although there's been far too much of that already, frankly. But as part of the recovery from the pandemic, don't do what you did after 2008 and simply you know, pour money out through quantitative easing, focus it on economic transformation. Uh, and a key aspect of that, I hope, this has been, you know, promised by the Biden team again, uh, will be the Green New Deal, which my book is largely written in support of. In other words, as part of economic reconstruction, we should have huge amounts of investment in alternative energy, in public transport schemes, in electrical cars, and in the process, rebuild the technological bases of our economies, uh, but also um, create as many secure, well-paid, skilled jobs as we possibly can, especially, of course, in those coal-producing or oil-producing areas where the populations will be hit most by a shift from fossil fuels. So that is my hope for the economic consequences of the pandemic. And of course, we will see, you know, over the next year or two, whether that hope was justified. Thank you. I will ask one final question before opening the floor to, uh, to our audience to ask their questions. Your book expresses strong support of, for the idea of a Green New Deal in the USA and elsewhere. How do you see the chances of this in the wake of the pandemic crisis? Well, I think, I mean, I, I'm not known as a great optimist, um, as my students, if any of them are listening, will confirm, many colleagues. Um, but on this, I am actually more optimistic than I was uh, a year ago, uh, despite the fact that my candidate, she didn't know it, alas, but she was my candidate. <clears throat> Elizabeth Warren did not win the Democratic nomination or the presidential elections, but she, she did manage to, to nudge, coerce, arm twist Joe Biden into verbally, at least, adopting a large part of her program. 
Uh, and you also see that with several European governments. Uh, and of course, some European governments, Denmark is, is you know, the, the leading example, uh, have already done actually a lot, have done very well in this regard. Now, of course, I'm not suggesting that, you know, <laughs> the problems that the US faces are, you know, they are, to put it mildly, on a bigger scale than Denmark's when it comes to this. But nonetheless, I do think, or I hope, that the pandemic will have shaken us up shaken economies up um, sufficiently to lay the basis for this. And also, I mean, just one thing more, um, you know, after 2008, uh, you had this weird mixture on the one hand of quantitative easing you know, by state banks, on the other of, especially in Britain, I'm sorry to say, but in the European Union as, you know, uh, attempted to be enforced by Germany uh, of, this, this notion of austerity, you know, that we, we can't afford this level of debt, we must pay it off. The only way of paying it off is by cutting social services and so forth. Well, as actually 2008 demonstrated, and as the pandemic has demonstrated, it, it is a little bit like a war. In a real emergency, states can find huge amounts of money. You know. The argument that we do not have the money uh, to deal with climate change has been proved now to be a false one. If we can be brought, if governments, if peoples can be brought to regard this as a true emergency, they can find the money, just as they found the money, you know, to deal with the immediate consequences of the pandemic. And I think that this is a very important intellectual shift. Unfortunately, it hasn't gone nearly far enough in, um, uh, in America, for example. But you know, now, um, if you read the Financial Times, for example, you know, people who 15 years ago were still really arguing the Washington consensus, you know, limits on state uh, involvement in the economy, in an absolute free market, um, laissez-faire ideology. Even they are now saying, no, you know, we've learned that the state has to play a leading part. And what they're also saying, in part as a result, of course, of the election of Trump uh, and um, you know, the rise of the extreme right in Europe among the working classes is, we've got to do something about inequality. You know, if we simply let the free market operate completely freely and go on generating this level or even increased levels of inequality, uh, then our, the stability of our democratic systems, even, you know, I wouldn't have said this even a few weeks ago, but I would now say the, the, the survival of our democratic systems will be in danger. Um, and so I think this intellectual shift uh, could be very important is important and also will provide a, a strong intellectual basis for um, different national versions of Green New Deal. Thank you very much, Professor Levin, for your insights and for your thoughtful consideration to developing an, an actionable plan for the future. Now we will take some questions uh, from the audience for, for our remaining time. So there are two ways of doing this. You could either raise your hand uh, and uh, we will call on you uh, by un unmuting your microphone. I will call on you, un unmute, we will un unmute your microphone and then uh, you can speak. Alternatively, you can send your questions in the Q&A function. So I will start with uh, a hand that was raised from the very beginning of the, of the talk by Hassan. Ayat al-Qadi. Hussam, could you please uh, unmute uh, your... Yes, hello, am I audible? Yes, you are. Please go ahead. Thank you, thank you very much, Dean Dalal, and thank you very much, Professor Levin, for the very, very thoughtful uh, uh, presentation. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in reading the book, to be honest. I do have some sort of disagreements, let's say, with uh, this view. Uh, so I'd like, I'd like you to... Uh, sort of express your uh, opinion on these two questions of mine. 
So first of all is, uh, what would your response be to Bjorn Lomberg's uh, much promoted argument on the costly pursuit of reducing carbon footprints, where even if severe cuts and significant barriers were raised, effectively hindering the lives of millions of people around the world, the sought after positive impact falls short of the goal that we all universally seek. The second question is on your comment on the market's inability to take the reins for pro-climate pursuits. Is this a matter of actual inability or is it perceived inability from our end due to regulations, uh, state regulations, restricting entry of innovative startups into the energy se uh, sector? So for an example, we have this new uh, startup called uh, Ecotricity, I believe. They're, they're planning on taking carbon emissions and turning it into diamonds, which will be effectively sold in the market again. This is just one example. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Well, on the first point, you know, I, I already mentioned the case of India. Um, India, among the really big economies of the world, is the most endangered, but you know, similar, though lesser fears have been raised for China as well, uh, which is that, you know, and this, this is the calculation of the World Bank, by the way, you know, not, not Extinction Rebellion or whatever, by mid-century, in other words, a generation from now, if present trajectories continue, uh, the Indian economy will, will have begun to decline as a result of climate change, on, on top of you know, existing problems, water shortages, and so forth. So as far as India is concerned, um, uh, Lombok's uh, argument is, is, is completely false. The costs you know, once again, not for future generations, well within the lifetime of our students um, and, and their elder brothers and sisters, uncles, uh, the, 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 the economic effects will have produced decline unless we do something about this. So now, of course, this is India, it's not, you know, America or whatever, uh, but um, what I think we must also recognize is, and I talk about this in the book, that if this happens in India, Pakistan even more, Bangladesh even more than that, West Africa, also a highly endangered um, area from the point of, view of climate change, already suffering water shortages, and with a hugely growing population, this is likely to set off levels of migration which simply could not be accommodated by states in their existing form. So you're either going to see uh, a, an enormous rise, you know, returning to a question of Dean Dalal's uh, in the kind of social, ethnic, racial tensions that we've already seen undermining democratic politics in America and Europe, or you will see the states becoming essentially abandoning liberal democracy and turning into authoritarian fortresses. Uh, but of course, if that happens, it will also have the most drastic effect on global trading systems and the world economy. Uh, so I'm, you know, uh, my, my own view is that um, although uh, his argument seems to have some validity uh, as some um, as far as developed countries are concerned, and he's really only talking, you know, he's only talking about developed countries. You, you read him, he doesn't give a damn what happens to the rest of the world. You know, he doesn't think about India, or even about China, let alone you know, Nigeria or whatever. Um, I think he's simply wrong. Um, now, uh, on the second point, um, I, I don't think that it is state regulation which is responsible for this problem. And uh, I do regard state leadership as essential. And th the reason for that is a point on which I actually disagree, for example, somewhat with Nicholas Stern, for example, who believes that you know, a green revolution in energy and technology can be the equivalent of the steam revolution or the oil revolution or the electrical revolution. The, the problem is, as I said, that um, the, the existing cars, existing 
coal-powered uh, power stations, oil-powered power stations. They all do a perfectly good and a perfectly profitable job at doing what they were built to do, which is producing energy. The profit incentive to get rid of them is not there. And as a result, what we have seen in so many parts of the world, in China, in India, is not that economies have replaced their existing power stations. What they've done is they have taken care of new demand uh, for electricity with alternative technology, which indeed you know, is cheaper uh, in many ways. Um, but it's also, let's face it, it's often less reliable and it's expensive to introduce. Uh, and so, once again, simply leaving it to capitalist economies, the motive to abandon existing technologies from a profit point of view is, I would say, not there. The motive to build new technology, eventually to replace it, is there. But based purely on, on profit considerations, that will not be remotely fast enough uh, to um, reduce our emissions in what the scientific consensus says is the time available to us. I will now read a few questions from the Q&A and then come back to the raised hand. These questions were posted early on also in, in the lecture. A couple of questions from uh, uh, Nisha Chafi from the Arab Youth Climate Movement, Qatar. You mentioned regarding security, climate change poses great uh, risk on security, poses great risk on security. Even the new US government has special envoys for, for security. Do you think Gulf countries should, should think towards the same? And uh, another question from uh, Nishad. Uh, what do you think the role of youth play uh, given global youth move, movement calling for climate across the globe, for climate uh, control ac across the globe. Our region and countries are far behind, uh, sometime nil. How do you think we can tap uh, your potential uh, in awareness and solution? Well, on the first point, absolutely. Um, after all, look, look at Qatar, look at the immense construction of the state and the economy that has been going on you know, over the past, well, several generations, but especially over the past generation. Now, this is not intended simply to provide a good life for the Qataris of today. This is intended to build up Qatar as a state and nation for the future, as a center of you know, as, as a key center of the Arab and Muslim worlds for once again, this age of the world, for generations to come. If Qatar finds itself in a global process, and of course Qatar itself can only do a limited amount about this, but um, nonetheless, I mean, Qatar is an extremely wealthy state, does have an ability to bring influence to bear. But if Qatar becomes part of a, a process which will inevitably lead to Qatar becoming essentially uninhabitable because of temperatures uh, and largely flooded because of sea rises, that comes somewhat later, uh, 100 or 200 years from now, then everything that is now being done to build up Qatar will have been pointless in the long term pointless. So that's the first thing. And once again, you know, Arabs, Qataris, people in the Gulf looking back from the perspective of the you know, generations to come will say, look, all these things that Gulf countries have been arguing about, Saudi fear of paranoia about Iran, Iranian fear of the Saudis, the blockade of Qatar, you know, all of that was irrelevant to this existential threat, which is coming down the road towards us. So that's the first thing. On what youth can do, uh, well, I can only uh, talk about my own children. <laughs> I would say embarrass your parents. Um, that's, um, that's probably the most effective you can do. The thing you can do, embarrass them and embarrass them, go on embarrassing them, you know. Um, 
at least in your own family circles, be like Greta Thunberg. Um, you may not make yourself altogether popular with your elders from that point of view, but you know, uh, just you know, po point out if they don't get it right that you're going to have you and your children are going to have to to bear the consequences. Um, now, of, of course, you must do this politely, speaking as a as a parent myself, you know, and a professor myself. Uh, but nonetheless, um, polite but firm would be my advice. Um, the next question is from Professor Daniel Rag. Uh, this is Daniel. I am attending this lecture with the students from my energy policy in the Middle East class. Could you address the opportunities and potential drivers for climate policies, especially in Qatar? Well, of course, the danger um, in this part of the world is, quite frankly, the moves to the, the abandonment of oil. Um, which obviously will have, uh, the more it happens, a very severe effect on certain economies. Uh, and uh, if they are to survive, um, then the economies will have to you know, move to, uh, as Qatar has been do doing its, its utmost to do, of course, will have to move to um, alternative ways of making money, alternative bases for the economy, alternative technologies. Now, Qatar, probably of all countries in the world, Russia is to a lesser extent similar, is somewhat insulated against this because gas will probably be the last one to go, um, both because it is the least of all the fossil, uh, least damaging of all the fossil fuels in terms of the greenhouse effect, uh, but also because, frankly, um, so many energy systems around the world are totally dependent, at least for domestic purposes, on gas, uh, that um, getting rid of them completely within two generations seems almost impossible. So Qatar does have a, you know, an element of insulation. Uh, but um, Throughout the region, of course, uh, and I would say this very, very strongly for Pakistan as well. I made this argument till I'm blue in the face in Pakistan. Um, of course, these countries are uh, among the countries in the world which have the greatest opportunities um, as far as solar power is concerned, but obvious reasons of, of weather. Um, and um, I would hope that Qatar will not only invest in this as far as Qatar is concerned, which by the way, cynically speaking, will also allow Qatar to export even more gas. Um, but that Qatar will use its economic aid to help other countries in the Middle East turn to solar power. Um, and I would hope that um, countries that give help to Pakistan or Bangladesh, for example, will also tie this to the adoption of solar power. I was very disappointed to find that the Chinese aid package to uh, Pakistan is, is not nearly devoted enough to this and is far too devoted to coal. But I hope that will change in future. Um, another question from uh, Dean Jaloudi. Is individual action pointless? If I willingly reduce my carbon footprint by flying less and eating less beef, would that just lead to cheaper flights and beef for others and ultimately uh, result in the same consumption? Can individuals fight climate change or is it ultimately up to governments to fix this? I think you know, individuals have a civic duty, if you like, to set a good example um, to a degree. I. I'm not a vegan myself. I've greatly reduced my beef consumption. Um, and I take trains when, you know, they are a real alternative. Uh, but obviously taking a train from Doha to London uh, or Doha to Islamabad or Doha to New York is not a, a, a real alternative. So I fly. Um, so basically I agree with you. It is, I mean, action on the scale necessary requires the action of states. Uh, decisions by states, um, taxes by states, uh, even, you know, an element of coercion, I mean, soft coercion, I hope, by states. But I would just say one thing more. Um, if uh, 
I were forced to um, basically give up international, the great majority of my international flights. I, I, I would, of course, be very sad about that. Uh, I would be a great deal less angry, however, if an element of rationing was involved. In other words, um, if, as during wars, there was some attempt to make sure that, of course, within certain limits of economic necessity, um, everybody was rationed, but rationing also applies to the, the, the rich and not only to the, you know, the middle classes, uh, a sufficient degree of rationing would greatly, I think, diminish the anger that this kind of thing produces. And that, uh, for me, was the, um, the disastrous aspect of um, uh, Macron's uh, fuel tax. Um, the fuel tax itself, absolutely necessary. But the point is that there was no attempt uh, to spread the burden of this um, in ways that compensated, at least emotionally, or, you know, or, or shifted a disproportionate amount of the of the burden onto the rich. That's not a, an economic argument, but it is a very powerful political argument. Uh, if you try to introduce um, rationing for the mass of the population without rationing for the elites, well, then you head, head towards some, some you know, that, that was the situation in St. Petersburg uh, in, a, in March 1917, and the result was revolution. So um, that's another argument for the Green New Deal and for linking action against climate change with egalitarian policies. Uh, now we go to the raised hands. Atif al Harbi. So we will now please unmute and go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, that's good. Uh, yes, um, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Sears, uh, you, Dr. Ahmed Al Dalal, and your guest, uh, Professor Anatole Levin for this informative uh, uh, lecture. Um, I am Atif Al Harbi, the former head of the delegation of Kuwait at UNFCCC. I've been involved in the UNFCC deliberations since 1992 till 2015, after we endorsed the Paris Agreement, I retired. So I am one of the elder people here with some conservative point of views, not like your students, uh, Professor. Uh, professor, I didn't, have, <laughs> I didn't have the chance to read your book, but uh, rest assured that I will buy it because now I'm, 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 I'm posting, I'm, I'm uh, pursuing my postgraduate studies. Uh, I'm 60 years old and I'm doing that right, right, right now. Uh, as we say in Arabic, however, um, I, I want to say one thing here after I listen to you very carefully. Uh, give emphasis to the nation states to address the issue of climate change. It's nothing new. If you go to the agreement itself, the Convention of Climate Change, you will find in the preamble that uh, the agreement uh, or the, uh, the, the, the convention affirmed, the parties affirmed that uh, the principle of sovereignty of state and international cooperation to address climate change is there. Not only this, the, the global nature of climate change needs global cooperation by countries. So, so, so it's been there, it's been affirmed. Uh, so any liberal institutional uh, paradigm seek international government to address climate change is beyond the merit of the convention itself. This is number one. Uh, number two, I would like to say that Paris Agreement, Kyoto Protocol are part of the UNFCC convention. They are building on these convention. They are not an autonomous um, legal instruments. People think that Paris Agreement is something else than the UNFCC, no. It's built on the principle of uh, principles and objectives of the United Nations Convention on Climate Change, 1992. 
So having said that, I would like to say a very important thing, that the Climate Change Convention is multi-faceted, or let's say multi-dimensional agreement. It's not environmental. And I'm addressing your students here. It's not only environmental. It's ethical, political, socioeconomic, and, and, and so many dimensions can be there, legal as well. When I say ethical, I mean the issue of common but differentiated responsibility, the issue of equity, the issue of addressing the adverse effects of mitigation response measures, not only addressing the climate change, uh, uh, addressing the climate change ad uh, adverse effects. This is very important for the GCC countries. You have to minimize those negative impacts of your response measures on me by helping me as a country to diversify my economy, to transfer the technology, the financial aids for me as well. You, so what I'm trying to say is this convention, this convention is a package of compromise and it covers all greenhouse gases issue. The only thing I heard from you or from your host is addressing carbon dioxide. Well, greenhouse gases, sorry about that. It's not CO2, it's nitrous oxide, it's methane, it's CFCs, PFCs. So we are talking about six kinds of greenhouse gases. Yes, three of them are under the Montreal Protocol, but we have methane, we have CO2 and nitrous oxide. Nobody talk about it. Another thing, this convention is not talking only about mitigation. All the discussion that I hear now is about mitigation measures. What about adaptation? What about financial aids for developing countries? What about the capacity building of developing countries? Increase the capacity building of the, uh, what about adaptation? All of these, all of these are part, integral part of the convention that we have to take care of and, and to implement it. The problem is that developed countries, Annex One parties, such as uh, USA, European uh, Union, I will stop here. I will stop here. I will stop. Please, yeah. Thank you. I will stop here. Okay, the last, last but not least, last but not least. The problem is Annex One parties are applying what I call pick and choose approach when it comes to the uh, UNFCC uh, process and convention. They pick what mitigation and fee, 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 forget everything about, about adaptation, financial aids, capacity build, building, transfer of technology. Now you mentioned something about BAT, border adjustment tax or border carbon adjustment tax, which is a disguised a trade barrier. And we have to, having said that, I would like you, uh, Professor, uh, Anatole, and I would like to keep contact with you as well. If you can send me his, his uh, email, please. I would like to, to, to contact in this. Uh, uh, this green, or you mentioned something about the new green deal or something. Uh, sorry if I didn't care. A green, yeah, the, the green new deal. This green new deal should address not only renewable energy, it should address also the clean fossil fuel technologies like carbon sequestration or carbon capture and storage. I didn't hear anything about this technology. At the end of the day, we are mitigating or combating greenhouse gases, not fossil fuel. We are combating CO2 okay. and methane and others. So thank, thank you so that, much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank, thank you, you very so much, much, sir. You, you and and yeah, I, I'm, I'm eager to others, hear the answer yeah. by, by Mr. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Uh, to take the points in order, uh, absolutely, um, I, I know. Um, that is, you know, what my book says, that the, the international agreements are explicitly between states and intended to produce state action. Uh, the, the, the argument of the book is simply that uh, the environmentalist camp uh, should recognize this, uh, cease to dream about alternatives, uh, and should think seriously about, therefore, how state populations can be motivated to bring about the necessary changes. Uh, on, on the subject of, of greenhouse gases, once again, of course, I know, and the, the book talks uh, about methane, 
uh, as the most dangerous of all. Um, and the threat of the release of methane from the Arctic permafrost, something which, by the way, is already beginning as the most serious uh, danger of what's been called a, a tipping point or a feedback loop, uh, whereby two degrees or even 1.5 degrees will then set off um, unstoppable changes, uh, which will actually produce catastrophic levels of climate change, possibly within a very short time. So yeah, methane, absolutely. And yes, all the others. Um, you know, CO2 is obviously the, the, what I mean, one of the biggest of them in terms of quantity. But yeah, all, the, all, all of this is important. Uh, once again, uh, I mean, when it comes to the transfer of technology, um, I have noticed that um, Gulf countries have been able to buy a great deal of technology. Uh, the question is what they're spending their money on. It's for them to decide what they want to spend their huge wealth on in terms of buying technology. Uh, as far as others are concerned, well, I'm speaking here for the Gulf. Um, uh, I, uh, uh, I've, I've advocated again and again in Britain and America that aid to Pakistan be, for example, I only mentioned Pakistan because it's about Pakistan that I've been, able, I've been asked to advise Western ministries, um, should be radically recalibrated towards promoting alternative energy. Um, so there's an element of aid there. Uh, but of course, you know, Qatar um, has a lot of international aid to give as well and could devote it to that. So does Kuwait. Uh, as part of adaptation, absolutely. I don't disagree with you at all. And in the book, I, one of my criticisms of the fundamentalist environmentalist camp or the sort of hard line left-wing environmentalists is precisely that they have this, these dogmatic attitudes. One of their dogmatic attitudes is, is their dogmatic hatred of nuclear energy. Uh, even when actually, you know, this at the moment is an absolutely key part uh, of energy production, which does not burn fossil fuels. Um, and also their, their absolutely dogmatic opposition to mitigation uh, and to, well, and to extraction. Uh, I, I believe absolutely that we must uh, invest in um, uh, trying to develop because remember, they're not there yet. Um, they are being researched, but we do not at present have the technology on anything like the scale required to extract carbon from the atmosphere. And of course, carbon capture at source, you know, from coal burning, oil burning power stations. Absolutely, all of this must be part of, you know, investment, uh, state investment, private investment uh, in the struggle to to limit carbon emissions and not just, you know, re reduction in the um, uh, the production of carbon uh, emissions. Um, and uh, yes, I mean, um, extraction and finally mitigation uh, of the effects. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, if you take water in South Asia, um, the threat of water shortages, the point has been made again and again uh, for so many countries that water shortages are rarely absolute. It's a question of the efficiency of water use. And an, a key challenge for South Asia, for West Africa, for other parts of the world as well, which are suffering from water stress, uh, is precisely to move away from at present very water inefficient use in agriculture and, and in uh, urban provision as well to efficient use. Uh, the problem is, of course, that once again, this takes not just a uh, huge investment, uh, but it may take um, measures of state encouragement in terms of taxation, which will be politically very, very difficult. And so one comes back again to the issue of political will and how to mobilize it. Uh, but one shouldn't despair over this. Um, you know, a couple of generations ago, South Asia um, managed South Asian agriculture managed to adopt the Green Revolution with tremendous success. So I am not unhopeful uh, that uh, South Asian farmers can do the same thing with the, the transition to efficient water use as one part uh, of the struggle to mitigate the effects of climate change. 
Thank you, Anatole. We, we have about 12 minutes left, so I, I hope we can uh, accommodate as many questions as possible. We have a raised hand from Hamad Al Thani. Please uh, let's unmute and uh, please go ahead. Hamad Al Thani, I'm part of the uh, the composition of AB. One question I would have about uh, these plans is, I you said like countries that uh, switch away, but uh, for example, our country here, our wealth is built upon a specific fossil fuel, natural gas. And pre, you know, natural gas being expanded upon in our country, as told to me, my, my parents, things used to be very different here. Used to, people used to be much poorer, quality of life used to be uh, much worse. So one question, so in case of countries where the wealth and the good life that their people can live now is because of fossil fuels. How can we convince nations to switch away from it with, and convince them that it won't lead to their country collapsing and going back to that sort of uh, dark age that they were once were in before? Well, I would say uh, simply by an intensification and a certain degree of redirection uh, of what Qatar has been doing already with tremendous effect and great determination, which is to lay the basis of an economy, to use the money from gas, uh, to lay the basis of a state and economy which will survive and remain prosperous after the gas has gone. Uh, and um, whether the gas has gone because it runs out eventually or because the gas goes because um, due to action against climate change, nobody wants to buy it anymore. Uh, by the way, I mean, I do think, as I said, Qatar has, has more time than other countries in that regard. I believe that gas will be the fossil fuel that goes last. Uh, but one sees not just in Qatar, but other Gulf, Gulf countries as well. Uh, how enormous amounts of money have been invested in creating great cities, economies, universities, if I may say so, um, in present circumstances, uh, to, to lay the basis of post-fossil fuel societies and economies. Um, uh, in the context of climate change, um, of course, uh, what I would like to see is that uh, more of this investment be directed uh, into um, the development of, uh, well, first, of course, alternative energy technologies, and obviously Qatar is ideally suited to solar energy, but also, um, and here the, 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 the mitigation point is so important, um, what would, of course, save the existing gas-based economy in Qatar oil-based economies elsewhere, um, is if there could be developed technologies for carbon capture at source, in other words, you know, from the, um, the power stations, uh, even on a much smaller scale from the cars, of course, so that is less imaginable, um, which would enable um, the world to go on burning in lesser levels, but still significant levels of fossil fuel without uh, producing climate change and endangering the world. Um, you know, my dream, but I believe it would be a, a, a Qatari dream as well, um, is that Qatari investment should help to produce, I don't know, take for example, you know, graphene. If graphene could be actually produced industrially, this amazing new uh, um, kind of whatever material that has been developed in the laboratory, if that could be produced in industrial quantities, it would actually enable us to capture a large part of our carbon emissions at source. Um, if, if Qatari investment could go to a laboratory which eventually pro mass produced graphene, well, that would be absolutely wonderful for everybody, including Qatar. Now, I'm not saying this will happen. This may be scientifically simply impossible, but you get the idea. Um, 
there are areas of investment um, that Qatar could make, which would not only help humanity in general, but might, might actually help Qatar to go on more or less along existing lines. The next question is from Aisha Akbal. How could governments of developing countries, especially weak states, go about convincing their masses to make their economy or specifically their manufacturing practices less carbon intensive if a majority of population just does not care what happens 20 years later as long as they have food on their table today? Well, one of the subsidiary arguments of the book is, uh, and I hope the representative from Kuwait will, will not um, take too much exception to this, uh, is that uh, in one way, the diplomatic effort of the United Nations and the forces contributing to these different agreements has been misplaced. That is because of the attempt to get a global agreement on climate change, basically involving every state around the world, or the great majority of them. In actual fact, um, around two thirds of emissions are produced by six countries. Uh, if you count the European Union as, as one block, China, the USA, India, European Union, Japan, Russia. Now, it might have made much more sense, instead of trying to get these universal agreements, which of course is very much part of the UN tradition and spirit, if you had simply concentrated on getting agreement between these countries, and of course these countries are also still, um, the, the countries, especially of course China, but increasingly India as well, uh, which are responsible for the great majority of the world's manufactured goods in terms of manufactured trading. And so, you know, obviously, I, I understand very well go, going to a, a, you know, a poor country in Africa um, and telling them that, you know, you must sacrifice the prosperity of this generation for future goals. No, I mean, that's impossible politically and morally questionable. But then you see you don't have to, because Africa produces only a tiny proportion uh, of the world's carbon emissions. Um, the point is to, to go to the countries which do, uh, and if you're talking to the two greatest developing countries from that point of view, China and India, in terms of, of carbon emissions and manufacturing, well, what you say to them is, um, look, look at the evidence. If we do not limit carbon emissions, to which you especially China, but more and more India as well, contribute a huge proportion, then within the lifetimes of people today, once again, not their grandchildren or great grandchildren, people alive today will, will see their living standards decline already when they're only middle aged. So, you know, this is the answer. Um, only a very foolish person, I mean, burns away their prosperity today uh, and does not try to save money for future things, for their children, for their old age, and so forth and so on. That is what uh, the populations and economies of India and China will be doing if they do not take radical action against climate change. It, it's not a question of, this is the core argument of the book. It's not a question of doing it for humanity. It's not a question of doing it for other countries. It's not even in these cases, a question of doing it for future generations. It's a question of doing it for yourself as a country and a population. Uh, Iman Shamari uh, has a raised hand. Could you please? Uh... Uh, unmute Iman and go Hello. ahead. Hello, yeah, yeah. my name is Iman al -Shamari. I work in Qatar National Library and I'm also a PhD student in Sheffield in uh, National Libraries. Um, I would like to ask you if, if there is an advice for young scholars um, who wants to work in think tanks, who wish to, to know how to read their, to know how to 
uh, write such reports for uh, institutional programs uh, because since 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 10 years when we saw first time Fahad Al Atiya talking about Qatar, a country with no water, we always think of ourselves we might be in his position uh, someday. But uh, these kind of efforts, it's produced by think tanks. And as far as I know, we don't have as much many in Qatar. And if we do have, their reports are not for public. So what is your advice for young scholars? Well, I'm happy to say we do have at least one think tank, which is called the Center for International and Regional Studies, or CIRS, uh, which is the host of this, um, this lecture, um, and, and whose publications are for, for everybody, you know, for, for, for the public in general. Um, Clearly, I, I would strongly advocate and hope for um, a Qatari national institute devoted specifically to climate change um, and uh, consideration of all its aspects, including the political and geopolitical ones. And I believe also that um, th this would be th this would be another element in building Qatar as a center for the Gulf, uh, the Middle East, um, and uh, South Asia as well, you know, a well-funded center devoted to this theme. Um, now, as far as individuals are concerned, uh, there is one problem here, which, <clears throat> which is, which I was acutely aware of um, when writing uh, this book, uh, which is, of course, that I, like the great majority of humanity, I'm not a scientist. Um, you know, and, and in the book, I, I do not argue on the scientific issues, um, and I don't get into the very specific details of predictions or whatever, because I don't have the intellectual background to do so. What I say is, I do two things. One is, as in, you know, every other sphere of public life, you know, as far as sensible people are concerned uh, we accept the scientific consensus you know we we if if the great majority of scientists say something then unless you know it is disproved it, you know unless other scientists convincing very convincing majorities and numbers of scientists bring contrary evidence we believe it what else can we do and certainly on on climate change you know you have had huge majority of scientists by now for get, almost three generations saying this. Um, but of course, if you're not a scientist, then you can't contribute to the scientific debate as such. But what, of course, you can do is, as I've tried to do in the book, is think through the social, economic, political, geopolitical consequences, uh, and to think about how to, about the political aspects and governmental aspects of generating state and international and you know, diplomatic uh, responses to the issue. So, um, and I think that, um, you know, as far as working think tanks are concerned, uh, there has been a lot at the international level. And of course, there have also been uh, specific studies like the ones I cited by the World Bank and by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology about specific regions. Uh, but there has uh, perhaps not been as much, certainly outside the West, uh, about the political implications of this. Uh, I, I, for example, have never seen a really in-depth study uh, of the way in which the Indian government, um, the Modi government, moved from a situation a decade ago or so when I found talking to people in the BJP, that there were enormous amounts of climate denial and rejection of action uh, to an Indian government, which is actually now the same people taking some really quite impressive and determined steps. So for example, a study of how and why they did that, uh, I'm just talking in one specific case here, would I think be very valuable uh, in a PhD, for example. Um. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. Professor Levin, do you mind if we take one or two extra minutes? That's fine. Uh, there are two raised hands. I will unfortunately not be able to read all of the questions and the question and answer list. 
Uh, we have uh, Lauren Lambert. Could you please uh, ask your question? Unmute, please. Um, I hope you can hear me now. Yes. Perfect. Thank you very much for this interesting uh, presentation and this important topic. Um, there are just a few points that I think should just be mentioned, especially for the students. Um, I'm quite concerned that you mentioned as an argument that of your book, that the problem with the UNFCCC negotiations, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, was that it tried to gather all countries to have one big agreement. But it happens not to be the case. The Kyoto Protocol, for instance, does not have the United States as a member country. And the Kyoto Protocol, which by the way, was renewed in Doha in 2012. I was there as a representative of Oxford University, a member of the delegation. And what happened is that it gathers some countries, thank God it gathers the whole of the European Union and those good willing countries were doing something, even if China, because of the common but differentiated principle was not obligated to decrease its emissions and the United States were not part of it. So it was not trying to have everyone or no one. So that's one aspect. The Paris Agreement tries to do this. This is different, but I think it's important to keep in mind that the UNFCCC has been more pragmatic than people tend to believe. And the second thing, which I think is very important to understand, and especially for some looking for research areas, is that technology transfer is not about allowing technologies to be transferred. That exists for a very long time. Technology transfer in the climate negotiations happened to be that the UNFCCC, UNFCCC pays for these to happen from industrialized countries towards developing countries. And that's there that we have the issue of the lack of payment and plus, because I was a board member of the technology body of the UNFCCC, I can give you the insight that industrialized countries have always tried to derail the technology mechanism. And when, for instance, me, I was a representative of the research community, I was arguing for research and development to be developed in the global south, countries such as Japan, the US, but also the European Union, or we're always trying to derail these efforts. And they were putting little money, not as much as they had agreed before. So my big concern is more about how the discussions are generally reframed and reframed time and over again, rather than, you know, it tries to be too um, perfectionist. It tries to be too perfect. No, there are agreements existing, by the way. The Kyoto Protocol, protocol still exists. Uh, Mr. There Lauren, is, could you please uh, end your question? My question, is, have... my question is, with all these agreements, actually, isn't it more that we should address the fact that these key leading countries are, not trying, are trying not to put the money where they were supposed to do it? And they were not, you know, and they are not addressing the climate situation. And that's really a matter of some countries blocking the system. Thank you. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, yes, uh, uh, hence the argument of the book that it's a question of political will. Uh, uh, as far as um, general agreement, you know, the, the attempt at universal agreement is concerned, yeah, of course, I'm, you know, aware of this with Kyoto. Uh, but if you follow the, um, if you follow the negotiations, uh, you know, and read people who were part of them, uh, certainly true that the attempt at general agreement rather than bilateral or trilateral uh, agreement has you know in you know has added enormously to the sheer amount of time which has had to be devoted to these negotiations uh, even when once again frankly in terms of carbon emissions many of the countries concerned were simply not significant um, in terms of what they were producing. Uh, now, 
uh, as far as technology transfer, uh, you know, alternative energy, for example, and lack of payment is concerned, well, I'd say two things. I mean, one is that, uh, you know, I, I myself have been engaged in arguments, completely fruitless ones, by the way, uh, which I mentioned earlier, uh, about redirecting um, British and European aid uh, to certain parts of the world towards promoting alternative energy. I have to say, though, that the only traction my argument got, for reasons you will understand extremely well, uh, was, uh, as so often, when I link this to specific national exports. In other words, you know, British aid to Pakistan goes to promote Pakistani import of British produced solar energy. So I think, um, you know, I, I am a realist, uh, an enlightened realist, I trust, ethical realist, but still a realist in international relations terms. And it would be very unwise, I think, to, to hope for a great deal of charity in this regard, uh, particularly, and this after all is a core argument of the book, in circumstances where, you know, Western populations are a, a lot poorer than they were um, a year or so ago and are in no mood to engage in charity uh, unless uh, they can be convinced that this is in their interest as well. Um, but once again, I, I think that as far as the really big um, carbon emitters are concerned uh, from developing countries, uh, India and China, some other places as well, uh, the um, it's not it's not a question of um, the West giving them money or Qatar giving them money. Um, I think in many cases they throw it back in our, our faces. Certainly the Chinese would do so. The point is that they need to um, that uh, they need to develop their own uh, alternative energy technologies, which after all is exactly what the Chinese have done with tremendous success and the Indians are, are also doing with considerable success, but not you know, coming to the, uh, the, the, the West for handouts in this regard, um, but doing it themselves for their own sake. Now, once again, there are many countries around the world which of course simply cannot afford to do that and simply do not have the, the technological base. But in general, um, they are secondary or even unimportant when it comes to emissions. So that's why I concentrate on the, the really important and dangerous countries when it comes to carbon gas emissions. Thank you so much, Professor Levin. Unfortunately, we will have to end this event. Thank you everyone for attending tonight and apologies for those uh, who asked questions that we could not answer. Uh, please join us for future events under this year's Environmental Studies Initiative, and perhaps some of your answers could be addressed then. We do intend to continue our focus over the months and uh, weeks and months to come in, on this particular initiative. And uh, of course, thank you very much, Professor Levin, for, for your insights, for uh, and for your uh, also for the for your answers to the questions raised by the audience. If you want to hear more uh, from Professor Levin, he will be one of the panelists uh, on our event on January 26th at uh, midday at 12 p.m. on the U.S. elections and the future of American democracy. Uh, uh, and uh, with that. Thank you all. Have a good evening. And I hope we'll see you on, on, on in future events. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure.